So today I'm going to talk about sort of two separate subjects. Um, I'm going to talk about flow homotopy theory and I'm going to talk about the construction of exotic structures on, you know, symplectic manifold, exotic symplectic structures on Lyable manifolds. Um, and of course the second is going to be an application of the first. But I'll actually begin by talking about exotic Lyable manifolds and then afterwards I will talk about flow homotopy theory. So let me set the context for what I want to talk about today. So um, the lofty goal here is that given a Liouville manifold W0, and by this I mean we could, you know, if you like, you could specify further this is finite type and that it's Weinstein, we'd like to classify all Liouville manifolds W such that W is diffeomorphic to W0, but they're not Liouville isomorphic. And um, I'll remind you that a Liouville manifold means that uh, you know, it's an exact symplectic manifold. So the symplectic form is the derivative of lambda. It's symplectic. And the Liouville vector field is outward pointing at infinity. Right? And uh, the notion of Liouville isomorphism essentially just means that you preserve this structure. OK, so for the, some context for what I want to talk about, there's a result of, I guess, historically first Seidel Smith and then expanded on in a sort of different way by Mark McLean, which says that if you take W0 to be sort of a Euclidean space with its standard symplectic structure, R2K, there are infinitely many such W, which are all diffeomorphic to Euclidean space, but not symplectomorphic, and they're all, in particular, not symplectomorphic to each other. And these are all distinguished by symplectic cohomology with coefficients in the integers. Right? Then uh, this, is, this is a result from maybe around, I don't know, uh, 2010 or something. Um, and then a little bit later, following work of Maidansky and Seidel, Abu Zayed and Seidel gave a sort of a, a different way of seeing this, where, which particularly works when W0 is an affine variety. And from this, they produce infinitely many such W, which are all inequivalent. And these things are all distinguished by symplectic cohomology with coefficients in various rings. And in particular, they work with various, you know, various FP for different primes P. Okay. And um, the importance of this affine variety assumption is that they'd like W0 to be the total space of a Lefschetz vibration. And by using different sort of Lefschetz vibration surgery style techniques, they can construct exotic symplectic structures, which have interesting properties with their symplectic cohomology with respect to different coefficient fields. All right. So the result I'd like to talk today is a sort of, you know, it's a version of this in the spirit in the spirit of their result. So I'd like to explain that there exists a Liouville manifold W, which is diffeomorphic to the Euclidean space, but not symplectomorphic, um, that moreover has its integral symplectic homology being zero. And this is only in large enough dimensions. And in particular, I think, you know, as long as 2K is bigger than or equal to 68, you're okay. And the point is here that you know, the symplectic homology being zero is something which is satisfied by the standard structure, uh, the standard symplectic structure on Euclidean space. Okay. So in particular, symplectic homology with coefficients in the integers does not distinguish between this symplectic structure and the standard one. And instead, we would like to distinguish it by using some, using some homotopy theory. In particular, we dis it is distinguished by symplectic complex K theory. But what this means is we're taking flow cohomology, not with coefficients in an ordinary ring, but with coefficients in a ring spectrum. Now I'll talk a little bit later about how exactly we use ring spectra. Um, but for the first half of this talk, I would like to just sort of pretend that K theory um, with its ring structure given by the tensor product of vector spaces behaves like an ordinary ring, an ordinary multiplicative cohomology theory. Um, 
So a corollary of this result is that the, you know, complex K theory is generally, you know, for uh, an ordinary space, it's computed by us in a tier Hertzberg spectral sequence. Right? And a corollary of this is actually that this, that for symplectic homology, the tier Hertzberg spectral sequence actually fails to converge. Like you can see from this that the E2 page of the spectral sequence would have to be zero. However, um, what we're going to prove is that the symplectic homology, the symplectic homology with coefficients in K theory is non-zero, right? So maybe at first this is sort of disturbing or surprising, um, but really it shouldn't be, right? So there do exist spectra which have zero homology, but non-zero K theory. Um, but the, the feature which all these spectra have is that they have to be unbounded in both directions. They have to have infinitely many positive homotopy groups and infinitely many negative homotopy groups. Right? And of course, this is also a feature of symplectic homology. Symplectic homology is generated by the Rabe orbits um, plus some things in the interior. And in general, there's no reason to expect why the index of your Rabe orbits might be bounded below. So let me summarize by just saying that this thing in general should be seen as infinite dimensional and unbounded. Right? So in particular, this means that, you know, if you were to more generally study symplectic homology with coefficients in K theory, you can't understand it perturbatively by first knowing the integer valued version and then, you know, using a spectral sequence. But um, what we'll see is that actually the way we prove this result is going via rap Kaya categories, right? And um, the significance of this is that, you know, following ideas from you know, many people, such as Zach Silvan, or in particular, Ganatra, Pardon, and Shande, we could expect these sorts of rap Kaya categories to be the localization of a finite dimensional category. So what I mean by this is, by this is the following. We're going to understand W by presenting W as the total space of a Lefschetz vibration then the Fokaya category of this Lefschetz vibration has finite dimensional morphism spaces. In particular, these finite dimensional morphism spaces are then amenable to study by things such as the atia hertzberg spectral sequence, right? And then if we were then to try to deduce a result about the actual rap Fokaya category of the total space of the Lefschetz vibration, you could then use some sort of stop removal procedure. So the point if is- there's a, there's a question, sorry to interrupt, there's a question from Hiro Tanaka. Sure. Uh, Hiro, go ahead. Uh, okay, so I guess I'll unmute. Right, so uh, I love this uh, description of this unbounded uh, symplectic mm -hmm. cohomology, but even before passing to ring spectra, uh, if you actually just computed symplectic cohomology, for instance, for a finite dimensional ball in R2, you would find this unbounded and negative degrees and infinite dimensional thing, right? If you used the Novikov ring as opposed to an Novikov field. Um, for R2, um, uh, I, I am not sure whether or not if with the standard symplectic structure of the disk in R2, you have, certainly it's unbounded in one direction. Um, oh, I see. Yeah. And so I, I don't think there are infinitely, for, I don't think for R2, there are infinitely many Rabe orbits going in the other direction. Um, in general, this, Sorry, but, um, can I say one word? Yeah, so sure. you're right, Tim. In, in, with standard symplectic form on R2, it's infinite in one direction, but not in the other direction. <clears throat> so I agree with that. Yeah, I mean, this is, you can think about this for, for, for a cotangent bundle with their standard symplectic structure, right? The, the Rabe orbits correspond to geodesic flows on the base, right? And the index corresponds to, you know, some sort of index of, the, of these geodesic flows. And there, they're bounded in one direction. But so if I know that result, you know, it's unbounded in one direction for Novikov ring, like, uh, to what extent should I think of this complex K theory? Like, is this unboundedness just because of the two periodicity of K theory? Or is there actually something no, no, geometrically no, interesting? No, the, the unboundedness here comes from the fact that, you know, for a sort of a general Liouville manifold, the, you can look at all the Rabe orbits, right? These Rabe, if, you know, if you're working over, uh, say, a Calabi-Yau manifold, these Rabe orbits have an assigned index to them, right? And this index should, can be arbitrarily positive or arbitrarily negative, right? So you're, you're taking, it's like taking the K-theory of a non-connective spectrum. So can I make one comment? Um, yeah. If you take T star S1 mm -hmm. and equip it with a non-standard grading, 
then it will be unbounded. Okay, great. Okay, yeah. So, you know, th these issues to do with the boundedness and so on, um, then suggest that moving to a setting where you can, you know, studying these things through, you know, um, the techniques such as left shift vibrations might be particularly fruitful. All right. So now I'm going to explain the construction. Right? So the main input is the following fact. Given any finite cell complex X, you can always build a Lagrangian disk gamma in T star Rn for some Rn, such that the flow homology of the zero section in T star Rn and gamma is the reduced homology of X with coefficients in any ring. And this actually includes any ring spectrum. Um, if you like, uh, you could just take this result completely as a black box. If you want to know a little bit more about how you construct this, well, you would begin by embedding X into a sufficiently high dimensional sphere, um, taking a tubular neighborhood of X inside that high dimensional sphere, then finding a Morse function, which is negative on that tubular neighborhood and positive outside it, right? In particular, if you think through this construction, if the dimension of this finite cell complex is equal to K, then at least this certainly is true when N is bigger than or equal to 2K. Okay, so I've drawn a picture on the right here of sort of what sort of situation you might expect. Okay. Now, given this, what we can then do is then plumb two copies of T star SN together using this as a local model. And in particular from this, we obtain a Weinstein manifold M with two Lagrangian spheres, L0 and L1. So I've drawn a picture of them here, and you can sort of single out the point where the two T star SNs are joined, right, as being uh, plumbed together as being this picture above, all right? Um, if you like, you could produce this by starting with one uh, T star SN, um, taking a Legendrian sphere in the boundary, which is the boundary of this um, disk gamma, and then performing a critical handle attachment onto this. And in particular, we obtain these two Lagrangian spheres, L0 and L1, which have the feature that the flow homology of L0 and L1 with coefficients in any ring or ring spectrum R is given by the reduced homology of X with coefficients in that ring spectrum. Now, what we do is we set V0 to be L0 and V1 to be the Dane twist around L1 of L0. Okay, and the reason, and um, I should remind you that uh, these Dane twists can be computed entirely within the Fakaya category as cones of certain morphisms. In particular, this thing is equivalent to the cone of the map from H sort of the evaluation map from HF L1, L0, tensor L1 to L0 in the Fakaya category. Okay. So the, the important outcome of this construction, which you can see directly, is that you have two spheres, V0 and V1, which are isomorphic in the Fukaya category with coefficients in R, if and only if the reduced homology with co reduced cohomology of X with coefficients in R vanishes, right? And I guess you can sort of um, directly see this by say, you know, pairing these objects with say Lagrangian disks in the Fakaya category, you know, cotangent fibers on the two spheres that you're coming together, right? But this, this is sort of the main, what I've boxed here is the sort of uh, main result which powers this. Now what we do is we form a left shift vibration W over a disk with two, two critical points, which has V0 and V1 as vanishing cycles. So I've drawn a picture of this thing here. Right? So you have V0 and V1, right? Okay, and the main sort of algebraic wheelhouse here is this proposition, which I think is sort of an expanded version of something which I get an idea which first appeared in Maidansky's work which is that, and I'm sure maybe have been known to some people before that, which is if this group, this um, reduced cohomology of X with coefficients in R is zero, then, and R is any ring, then the symplectic homology of W with coefficients in R is non-zero. 
In fact, it should be isomorphic to the symplectic cohomology of T star Sn plus one with coefficients in R. And the way to interpret this result is that in the Fukai category with coefficients in R, V0 and V1 are isomorphic objects, right? So the Fukai category sort of thinks that these two spheres are Hamiltonian isotopic, right? In particular, this means that when you form this Lefschetz vibration W, from the point of view of the Fukai category, these two spheres, V0 and V1, can be closed up, right? And the thing you get in the end is that there's sort of an object of the Fukai category that looks like it should be the uh, total sphere Sn plus one, right? So this is sort of the basic, this here is sort of the basic non-vanishing result. Okay. And then it has a counterpart, which is a vanishing result. And that is if R is a field and being a field here is very important. And moreover, this um, uh, reduced cohomology of X with coefficient in this field is non-zero then the symplectic homology of W with coefficients in K vanishes. So this is the, this is the vanishing result. Right? And I should remark that um, the, the vanishing result is in some, some sense a lot harder than the non-vanishing result. Right? The, non -vanishing, the vanishing result requires knowing something about generation. You need to you know, compute what the wrap flow homology of the left shed symbols are and show that's zero. And you need to know that these left shed symbols generate the Fukaya category from which you conclude that this symplectic homology is not zero. On the other hand, the non-vanishing result is sort of a little bit simpler. The non-vanishing result just requires you to write down some sort of object of the Fukaya category and check that its um, endomorphisms are not zero, right? Um, and both these results sort of go via the technology, the technology of wrapped for Kaya categories. Okay. Um, but uh, I guess the thing I'd like to point out here is that um, in our application to ring spectra, the only new thing we want to do is extend um, part one, right? And the technology involved in part one is substantially simpler than the technology that's involved in part two. Okay. And um, I'd like to give you an example to sort of, you know, make this a little less abstract which is that if X is RP2, which is a Moore space, what does this actually mean? Well, we would have that SH of W with coefficients in Z mod two would have to be zero, but SH of W with coefficients in say Z adjoin the fraction half would be non-zero. So essentially, you know, you might think of this procedure as being something like inverting two in the Fukaya category of T star SN plus one. Okay. All right, so let's talk about our application. We're going to apply this to R being complex K theory. And the big thing which is going to power this result is the following fact, which um, goes back to the 1950s and is due to Adams and Toda separately, right? which is that there exist finite cell complexes X, such that the reduced cohomology of X with coefficient Z mod two is non-zero, but their reduced K theory is zero. So sort of the reason why this is interesting is that this second part implies by the churn character isomorphism that Moreover, you would have to have the reduced cohomology of X with coefficients in Q being zero. Right? So this is some sort of reflection of an interesting fact about say the two primary structure of the stable homotopy category. Right? It's entirely, every, everything here is a sort of a torsion phenomenon. Right? So these things, you know, while you can, while this, I've stated this is a fact about finite cell complexes, this is most naturally, these are most naturally constructed um, as statements about finite spectra. Right? So I think the sort of uh, a homotopy, a stable homotopy theorist sort of favorite example would be when X is a cone of a certain map from the eighth suspension of a mod two more spectrum to itself. And this map they like to call V1 to the four, right? And this V1 to the four has the special feature that it's um, action on K theory, which goes from the K theory of 
the mod 2 more spectrum to the K theory of the mod 2 more spectrum shifted down by 8 is an isomorphism. Right? But for dimension reasons, this map V1, V1 to the 4, has to be 0 on mod 2 cohomology. Um, but there are simpler examples as well, like um, I've drawn one here on the right, um, which is a sort of a diagram of a cell complex. So here there are eight cells, and I've drawn what the attaching maps are. So these attaching maps are degree two, and these attaching maps are by eta, which is the, the, the only non-trivial element in pi, stable pi one. Um, and if you looked at the E2 page of the atiyah hertzberg spectral sequence, you would have uh, Z-mod 2s in the following spots. And the differentials in the spectral sequence, there's one which goes from this guy to this guy, this D2, and there's another one which goes from this guy to this guy. Right? And um, in particular, you see here directly that the atiyah hertzberg spectral sequence dies after the E2 page. Anyway, you could just take this entire, you, you know, it, the actual form which these cell complexes take is of no relevance to this paper, this work, other than just knowing something about what dimension the results actually work in, right? Um, in particular, this thing here is a six dimensional cell complex, six dimensional finite, uh, sorry, sorry, this is a, a spectrum whose, homot whose generators exist between um, degree zero and degree six. So you might ask, when does this actually, when does this appear as an actual finite cell complex? And you would say a finite cell complex here exists in dimension 12. It possibly desuspends lower. So anyway, and uh, on this, in this example, I think, the dimension would probably be, have to be bigger than or equal to something like 18. So, you know, it's a, the exact form this take is not so important. Anyway, so you take this, you take this cell complex X as the complex X that was used up here um, to form our symplectic manifold W. Okay, right. Then once you do this, you obtain a Liouville manifold W with the following feature. It's symplectic cohomology with coefficients Z mod 2 vanishes, but its K theory does not vanish. This is a direct application of this sort of vanishing and non-vanishing result I explained earlier. Um, in particular, this leaves open the possibility that this thing might have symplectic cohomology with coefficients, coefficients in, say, Z adjoined a half, and you'd like to kill this, right? And the way we're going to do this is we're going to take the product of this manifold with T star of CP2, right? And here, use the Conniff theorem. So um, I'd like you to recall here that if Q is a spin manifold, then the symplectic cohomology of the cotangent bundle of Q um, is isomorphic to some sort of regrading of the homology of the free loop space of Q. But this importantly relies on the fact that the Q is spin. Um, and if the work of Krag and Abu Zayed tells us that in the case when Q is not spin, instead you have to take the homology of the free space with coefficients in a local system, which is the transgression of the second Stiefel Whitney class in Q, which of course is the spin obstruction, the obstruction to being spin. Okay. Um, so in particular, a computation, I guess, which I think was done first by Seidel, shows that the symplectic cohomology of T star CP2 with coefficients in Z is two torsion, right? So when we take this product up here and use the Kunath theorem, the symplectic cohomology of W cross T star of CP2 with coefficients in Z has to vanish, right? Um, I should comment here, but it's gonna come up later that um, here you, you could rectify this situation by taking symplectic cohomology twisted by a background class. Right. And this thing here would be isomorphic to Hn minus star and uh, free loop space of Q with coefficients in Z. Right. Now, the final thing we would like to do is 
we'd like to make this manifold contractible. So by, you know, then an application of the h coboldism theorem would have to be diffeomorphic to Euclidean space. And to do this, we could just take the further product of this with an exotic R2K, e.g. McLean's manifold. And this thing here would, the result of this is this has only homology less than the critical, in uh, supported in the subcritical dimension range. Right? So in particular, we can then attach subcritical Weinstein handles to kill the classical topology. And of course, this does not affect SH. Um, so what I've told you is a recipe to build a contractible Uval manifold with zero symplectic homology, with coefficients in the integers, but with non-zero K theory. Of course, this also involves checking what the symplectic K theory of these two manifolds are. Of these two manifolds, but in both cases, this is not so hard. These manifolds are pretty explicit. Um, all right, so that sort of ends this first part of my talk. I think maybe now is a natural place to ask for questions. All right, nothing? Okay, so if you uh, totally didn't understand anything at all which was going on in that first part, the second part of this talk is going to be pretty different. I'm going to talk about how you actually construct things such as the symplectic, co symplectic cohomology um, with coefficients in K theory or things like this and construct the Fukaya category. And here I'm going to be pretty sketchy. Um, I'm not going to talk about the sort of um, analytical or even algebraic considerations that go into here. Instead, I'd like to emphasize the topological considerations that go into the constructions of these objects and what restrictions that there are on their existence. So um, all these ideas of taking floor homology with coefficients in a ring spectrum go back to the ideas of Cohen, John Siegel in their paper in the Floor Memorial volume from 1994. So um, let's just explain the situation in Morse theory. If f is a Morse function from some manifold p to r, right, then we can look at the moduli space of gradient flow trajectories between any two critical points x and y. Right? Um, so this is the, the solution. So the gradient flow equation modulo by translation. This is very familiar. And the dimension would be equal to you know, the difference in the Morse indices. Okay. These are smooth manifolds. And moreover, they can be compactified to smooth manifolds with corners, which have the following combinatorial structure on their boundary. And sort of the boundary strata, the union of all the boundary strata, dm bar, is equal to the union of over all the critical point z of m bar of x z cross m bar z y. Right? Um, of course, this is just the usual structure of you know, the breaking of flow trajectories. So this is m bar x y and m x z m z y. Should be very familiar to most people in the audience. This structure, sort of more broadly speaking, Cohen, Jones, Siegel called a flow category. I'm not really going to spell out what this is. Right? But moreover, there's some extra structure that comes in Morse theory, which is the data of a framing. And what I mean is that these moduli spaces are not just any smooth manifolds, they're actually frame smooth manifolds. This means that their tangent bundles are stably trivialized. And this comes very explicitly because um, these sort of these spaces of gradient trajectories can be seen as the intersection of a descending disk and an ascending disk, right? And both, of, both these disks are canonically framed. So in particular, you see that the tangent bundle, the, the tangent bundle of M plus an extra R factor from translation, uh, plus the descending disk, so the descending tangent space of Y, the descending tangent space, is equal to the descending tangent space at x. Right? So I've drawn a picture here. So you have here, you have vx minus, and here you have vy minus. Right? Um, and the point is, these aren't just any sort of randomly chosen framings. Right? These isomorphisms phi are actually coherent under the flow category structure here. So Cohen, John Siegel called this a uh, frame flow category. Um, and then they described a way to sort of generalize the Pontryagin-Tom construction 
to from this produce a finite spectrum X. This finite spectrum X has one cell per critical point, right? And these moduli spaces M together with their framings and the flow category structure encode the attaching maps for the cells. Um, this should really not be that unfamiliar. Um, we're used to thinking about when the zero dimensional moduli spaces, which are the points, in this case, the framings on these zero dimensional moduli spaces is basically just a choice of whether or not you count this trajectory as being plus one or minus one in the Morse differential, right? And altogether, this is describing the degree of the attaching, right? And of course, you know, when you're attaching a K plus one cell onto a K cell, the only thing you actually really care about is the degree. Right? Um, I should say as well that this construct, this, this sort of idea is, um, it was sort of expanded a lot and sort of made abstract by Colin John Siegel, but it really goes back to the work of John Franks in the 1950s. So it's a really quite, a, you know, it's, it goes back really to the beginnings of Morse theory and the beginnings of stable homotopy theory. Okay. In particular, Cohen, Jones, Siegel proved that if P is a closed manifold, then X is actually equal to, X is equivalent. This is X being the homotopy type that you construct, the base suspension, the suspension spectrum of P with a disjoint base point, right? In particular, we see that for any extraordinary cohomology theory E, um, the cohomology of P with coefficients in E, which is, this is sort of maybe slightly non-standard notation, but I'd like to use it in analogy with ordinary cohomology, um, is isomorphic to this extraordinary cohomology theory when evaluated on X, right? Um, and of course, X is a spectrum. So this is always a, this is always a sort of a reduced homology theory, right? You know, which, sort of relates back to why we have to have this disjoint base point up here. Okay, so now in Fleur theory, let's talk about Fleur theory. And um, we're always gonna work here today on an exact symplectic manifold, which has sort of a number of consequences. The most important of which is that there is no bubbling. Right? For bubbling presents a wide variety of sort of analytical difficulties for us in the terms of the need to use sort of virtual perturbation theory. Um, but it also, you know, presents some topological difficulties in that um, you could have multiply covered bubbles um, and then the moduli spaces you get, you should be thinking of as orbifolds instead of manifolds and the sort of cobordism theory of these is very different, right? Um, and here you have an action functional from sort of some infinite dimensional manifold, P to R, which and I'd like to talk about both the Lagrangian case and the Hamiltonian case. As you know, in the Lagrangian case, this is the path space connecting L0 and L1. And in the case of Hamiltonian flow cohomology, this is the free loop space of the symplectic manifold M. And here you have, instead of a moduli space of gradient trajectories, you have a moduli space of flow trajectories connecting two flow orbits, X and Y. So we'll call this MXY. And again, we modulo out by translation. Uh, and these things admit a compactification M bar by broken strips in the Lagrangian case or broken cylinders in the Hamiltonian case. And the thing, you know, the much of what powers going into this is the fact that actually M bar can be made into a smooth manifold with corners. Now this is sort of a little bit of a hairy issue from a whole bunch of points of view. Um, my approach is to take some of the work of Fukaya O Ota Ono, who proved exp certain exponential decay estimates for the gluing maps that are involved. And then, crucially, we add in the fact that because we're working on an exact symplectic manifold, we can always work with non degenerate flow orbits. All the, you know, this is sort of a technical point, but all the gluing that has to go into this is between two, um, it was in two Riemann surfaces where you have very strong a priori exponential decay estimates on sort of either sides of the node which you're gluing along, right? And this is something which if you had bubbling, you wouldn't have, right? If, you know, um, and uh, if you had bubbling, you know, you have to do gluing with, um, you have to use some, uh, in your gluing, you need to use, um, 
Sobolev spaces with exponential weights, right? And this makes your estimates significantly weaker. Um, that's sort of all I want to say about this. Um, but I would say that uh, you can actually get away with just using topological manifolds instead of smooth manifolds. And this is done in the work of Abu Zaid and Blumberg. Um, so really, you know, maybe you didn't actually want to have to prove this. Um, but I would say that you don't actually get everything for free by working with topological manifolds, because then you have to work a little bit harder to really explain what you mean by the tangent bundle of M, and in particular, the tangent bundle of M at the boundary of the modular space. All right, so you know, no matter what you do, there's you know, some amount of work that has to be done. All right, so that's all I'm going to say about the analysis. Um, now onto the topology. The main problem in FLIR theory is that in general, these multi spaces M are not framed. And if this is sort of strange to you, you should really think about the following fact, which is that in the case of Lagrangian FLIR homology, these multi spaces of strips M are possibly not orientable unless you impose additional topological restrictions on the Lagrangians involved. In particular, people usually ask for the Lagrangians L0 and L1 to be spin. Um, what this means is that the flow homology of L0 and L1 with coefficients in the integers is just not always defined, right? And even when it is, it depends on some auxiliary choices, which are the choices of spin structures. Right? So what this means is it's way too much to ask for the existence of a flow homotopy type in general. Right? In Morse theory, what we could do is you could build this sort of universal spectrum X, right? And then produce you know, the flow homology with coefficients in any other extraordinary cohomology theory by evaluating that theory on X, right? In flow theory, this is far too much to ask for. So instead, we're going to ask for something weaker, which is when could we possibly define HF L0, um, which is when can we possibly find HF L0 and L1 with coefficients in a ring E without knowing the underlying homotopy type, because that might not exist. So E here is going to be a ring spectrum. And for the sort of topologists in the audience, for the entirety of this talk, ring spectrum will mean E infinity ring spectrum. So sort of a, a very brisk recap for everyone. For E to be a ring spectrum means that there's multiplication maps from E wedge E to E and a unit map from S to E. And these have to be associative and being an infinity ring spectrum means that these are more of a satisfy a commutativity relation right? and there are now many models of uh, structured ring spectra in which these notions make sense right? and then what would so that's what a ring spectrum is and then what is what would the flow homotopy type be instead of just being a spectrum we would like to define an e module so in analogy with ordinary algebra this means that M is an E module if there are structure maps mu from E wedge M to M, which again satisfy the appropriate relations. Right? And you know, of course, every E module is also, by forgetting the structure of it being an E module, it's also a spectrum, right? So you might be a bit confused and, and think, you know, I, I told you that you shouldn't have a flow homotopy type in general. Why couldn't you just take the flow homology with coefficients in E, and then just forget that it was an E module and get a spectrum, right? The point is that this E module is not necessarily of the form E smash X, where X is a finite spectrum. Right? And if, if this is bamboozling to you, I would sort of say the following thing. You can always define flow homology with coefficients in Z mod two, right? So in particular, you can get an abelian group by just, you know, it was every, every F2 vector space is in particular an abelian group. Right? But it'd be very dishonest to say that this abelian group is the flow homology of L0 and L1 with coefficients in Z, even though this thing is a Z module. Right? So, so we want to define an E module. So how do we do this? And the answer comes, again, from Cohen Jones Siegel's paper, where instead of to construct an E module, whereas to construct a spectrum, we wanted these things to be framed, for Tm plus R to be framed, we could ask for something weaker, which is we ask for these things just to be E-oriented. And of course, this is always going to mean 
coherently E-oriented under the flow category structure. So let me just recall a bit of topology to explain what this means. And if I have a real vector bundle, psi of rank k over y, um, we say that an orientation on this is an element ue in the E cohomology of the tom space y of psi. So this is the tom space, right? which recall it's the disk bundle of psi modulo the sphere bundle of psi. Right? And um, this is required to satisfy a property. And this property is that for all elements y, little y in y, you can always write down this embedding of a sphere into the tom space. So you look at the fiber over y, psi y, and you take a disk bundle modulo its sphere bundle. Okay? And this thing always embeds into the tom space. Right? So, so over each point in the base y, you have a sphere sitting inside the tom space. Right? And the requirement that for this element u to be a orientation is that when you pull back u to the e homology of the sphere, you need to get a generator. And what I mean by a generator is this. This uh, thing here, the, the e cohomology, the reduced e cohomology of the sphere, is always a free rank one e lower star module. Right? Where e lower star is the coefficient ring. Right? So it makes sense to ask for this thing to be a generator of this free rank one module. To be a bit more abstract, um, this tom space y psi, when you turn it into a spectrum, is a stable spherical vibration over y. Right? And this is just this fact that, you know, over each point in the base y, you have this sphere, which I've written down here. Right? Um, and in particular, you know, you could produce this stable, you could think about this stable spherical vibration in the following slightly more abstract way. So you first take the map from y to the classifying space of vector bundles, BO, which is given by psi, right? Now there's a map of spaces from BO to a space called BGL1S, which is, this map is the famous J homomorphism, right? And BGL1S is the classifying space for spherical vibrations. Right? So, it's the, so this composite of Y to BGL1S is just the classifying space of the Tom spectrum when thought of as a spherical vibration over Y. Right? But moreover, this BGL1S maps to BGL1E, which is via, oh, sorry. And this map is via the unit S to E. Right? What is this thing? Well, BGL1E is the group of units of the ring spectrum. Okay. And in particular, BGL1E is then the classifying space for free rank one E modules. And in particular, um, E orientation is then the same thing as a null homotopy of this map from Y to BGL1E. So this is completely bamboozling. Think of it simply in the following way. You have the tom space, which is a spherical vibration over y, right? From this tom space, you get a bundle of free rank one E modules, right? Which are exactly given by these things here, right? You have this bundle of free rank one E modules, right? And an orientation is just a trivialization of this bundle, right? Which means a null homotopy of the map from Y to the classifying space of such free rank one E modules, right? Which is a null homotopy of this map here. Okay, so let's step back a bit and talk about what this actually means in practice, right? So when E is the integer Z, this is exactly the usual notion of an orientation as you might've learned in you know, a first or second algebraic topology course in graduate school, okay? And in particular for Z, you know, GL1 of Z is Z mod two. So this map BGL1 of Z is going to be RP infinity. And this classifying map here is just the class of, is just this map to the classifying space here is just the one which corresponds to the first Stiefel Whitney class, Stiefel Whitney class of your vector bundle. All right. When E is equal to the sphere spectrum, 
Well, then an orientation of the sphere spectrum is exactly the notion of a trivialization of the spherical vibration. Um, these might be sort of hard to come across in practice, but they do arise whenever you know that psi is trivial. Okay. Now, there's another class of cohomology theories, which is very well studied and very important in algebraic topology, which are the so-called complex oriented theories, which include the integers Z, complex K theory, um, complex bordism, MU, and so on. And these all have the feature that every complex vector bundle is oriented canonically over these things. Um, you, could, you could reduce this to even talking about stable complex vector bundles as well. And the thing which is going to matter for this talk really is we're talking about K theory in the application, which I outlined in the first part. Um, and for K theory, orientations arise from spin C structures on your vector bundle. Um, and this is often called the Atiyah Bot Shapiro orientation. Okay, so what does this mean in flow theory? Remember, this space here, T, this vector bundle here, Tm plus r, is the thing which we wanted to put an orientation on, right? But of course, um, Tm plus r is the tangent space of the sort of space of flow solutions, which is cut out by an elliptic equation. In particular, this tangent space is computed as the index of the linearization of the equation, which cut it out, right? So in particular, you can write it as the Fredholm index of the linearized flow operator. Okay. And what does this buy you? It buys you that this index here, you can now compute using some version of the family index theorem. And actually, you don't need a very fancy version of the family index theorem. You just need the version of the, fan, the, the version of the family index theorem in its guise as a proof of bot periodicity. Okay. So I think rather than explaining how this particular thing works, I'll explain what this topologically means for the symplectic manifold that we consider. Okay. So for simplicity, for the remainder of this talk, I don't want to talk about issues to do with grading. So I will assume that our symplectic manifold M has its first term class being zero. So it's sort of a Calabi Yau manifold. And um, so we assume C1M equals zero, and we also assume that we have a witness for this. So this means some sort of complex volume form. And in particular, this means that all the flow groups and so on that we're talking about are going to be graded. Right? Now I'm going to write down the following composite map. Right? So we start at our symplectic manifold M, and now we take the classifying space, the map, sorry, we take the classifying map of its tangent bundle, which maps to BU. Really, I should probably write BSU here because I'm assuming that it's Calabi Yau, but I hope you'll forgive me for just trying to keep this notation a bit simpler. So you map to BU. And now there's a map from BU to the third classifying space of U, B cubed U, which comes from bot periodicity. This is the famous bot map. Okay. Now, from B cubed U, you can then apply the J homomorphism, D looped two or three times. Um, and this lands in B cubed G01S, which is the, I guess, second D looping of this classifying space of stable sphere bundles I talked about earlier. And then again, we can apply the unit in the map from S to E to get a map to B cubed G01E. So I'll call this whole map, this composite map, star. And the definition is that a background field on M, symplectic manifold, is a null homotopy of this composite. So this is an important stipulation that the symplectic manifolds we consider should come with such a null homotopy. Um, these do not always exist. And even when they do exist, they're not unique. Given any background field, you can always twist by any homotopy class of maps from M to B squared G01E. So sort of what this means is that if I gave you a gerb for E, right, you can twist any background field by that gerb. But the point is that in the presence of one of these, you can define Hamiltonian flow cohomology. Right? Um, I mean, you could actually define Hamiltonian flow cohomology in the presence of something much weaker, but we would like Hamiltonian flow cohomology to carry a lot of algebraic structure, right? And you know, even if you could define the E module, you'd want this to be some sort of ring. And for this ring structure, you really need the full background field, right? 
So let's talk about some examples. So let's begin with just E being the integers, which is something you're very familiar with. So here, um, a background field always exists, right? You can just, you can just check that this happens. That this, and um, so a background field does always exist, um, but there's a choice which goes into this background field as you can twist by a job, right? And um, here, the choice is given by maps from M to B squared GL1Z. As I discussed earlier, GL1Z is of course Z mod two. So this is any map from M to B squared Z mod two. These are better known as second cohomology classes of M with coefficients in Z mod two. And these things here are the so-called background classes, which I mentioned earlier as being used to sort of twist the symplectic cohomology of the non cotangent bundle of a non-spin manifold to get it being equal to the standard, com standard homology of the free loop space. The second example is that if your um, ring E is one of these complex oriented theories that I talked about earlier. So if it's complex oriented, one incarnation of this is that the map from BU to BGL1S to BGL1E, where of course this is the J-homorphism, and this is the unit, is canonically null. Right? There's, there's just a given null homotopy of this. Right? So in particular, if you assume that E is more of a sort of multiplicatively complex oriented, right? then this null homotopy of BU to BGL1E deloops. Right? And if you deloop it two times, you then get a canonical background class. Right? So this is saying that for any complex oriented cohomology theory, there is a canonical version of Hamiltonian flow cohomology. Um, and this is something which, uh, you know, in Abu Zaid and Blomberg's work uh, with applying to Murava K theory is extremely important. All right, so those are the complex oriented theories. Um, and on the next things I'd like to talk about when you might expect a background class to exist for any cohomology theory. So let's observe the following, let's look at the following diagrams. So in this middle row, I have the map from M to BU to B cubed U by the bot map, right? And here I have the J homomorphism, right? But I could also look at just this row here composed with the canonical map from BO to BU by complexification, right? So there's a fiber sequence from BO to BU to BU mod O down here. And BU mod O is actually the source of the real bot map. So there's also a bot map here, which I'll say this is the real bot map. This is the complex bot map, which maps to B cubed O. Of course, this, this is not strictly correct because there's some Z factors here I'm leaving out for ease notation, but just, just bear with me with this, right? And this square down here commutes. And moreover, there's a map from B cubed O to B cubed GL1S, which is also the J-homorphism. Here it's the real J-homorphism. This is the complex J-homorphism, right? And then the fact that this is a fiber sequence, right, tells you that this map from BO to B cubed GL1S is in fact canonically null. There's, there's always a canonical null homotopy from BO to B cubed GL1S. And maybe you'd want to map this further to B cubed GL1E, right? Um, so what this says that if M actually came with a stable Lagrangian distribution D, for instance, if M was a cotangent bundle, right? And you have the distribution on, t on M by the cotangent fibers, right? This of course means a lift of the classifying map of the tangent bundle to BU to BO, right? In the presence of such a stable Lagrangian distribution, then this map from M to BQ GL1S is canonically null homotopic, right? So in particular, this carries a background field for the sphere spectrum and then for any other ring spectrum E, right? So I'd like to give a warning here, which is for such manifolds with um, stable Lagrangian distributions, if you were to take a complex oriented cohomology theory, you are left with two possible choices of background class, background field. One of them is the canonical choice that you get from working with a complex oriented theory. And the other one is the sort of geometric choice that you get from the, from the stable Lagrangian distribution. And these may not have anything to do with each other. Right? So, and we've seen this before. So for the cotangent bundle of CP2, right? There was sort of two Fakaya categories that were of interest. 
on the one hand was when we took a background class uh, by the Steck and Siefel Whitney class of CP2. And on the other hand, we took the zero background class. Right? And this version corresponds to the complex orientation on Z. On Z. And this version corresponds to the foliation by the cotangent fibers. Tim, there's a question from Danny. Danny, go ahead. Oh, if you could just, I mean, I'm assuming the, um, it will depend on your choice of Lagrangian distribution. So if you can just say how, how that twist would work. Um, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so, I mean, um, it depend, depends very strongly on your choice of Lagrangian distribution, right? So the choice of Lagrangian distribution, you can think of as a lift, as a lift from this map to BU to BO. Right? So what's the space of choices of this lift? It's given by the maps of the fiber here, which is U mod O. Right? So there's a space of choices parametrized by the maps from M to U mod O. This is, this, you know, just, just think of U mod O here as being the classifying space of the Lagrangian, as being the infinite Lagrangian Grassmannian. Right? And of course, from U mod O, there is a map to, there's a map first to uh, B squared O, right? Um, which is the J homomorphism, uh, sorry, the bot map, and then there's a J homomorphism, sorry, to uh, B squared GL1S, right? Okay, so changing the Lagrangian distribution is a shift by a different map to U mod O. Now you could map this further to B squared GL1S, right? So this is like taking a gerb for the sphere spectrum of your manifold. And twisting by this job is how you get the new spectral Fukaya category with this different Lagrangian distribution. Okay. Thanks. All right. Okay, so, all right, so that's, uh, I'm very nearly out of time. Um, I'll just, for in the last two minutes, I'll say that what I just told you here completely applies whenever L is a Lagrangian, right? So when L is a Lagrangian, you know, the map from L to M to BU always lifts to BO, right? But this is TM and this is TL. This is all, you know, close to being, you know, the def this is close to the definition of being a Lagrangian. So what this means is that the map from L to B cube GL1 e is always canonically null. Right? So if this map from L to B cube GL1 e is always canonically null, and if you also have a background field, you can compare these two null homotopies together. And comparing these two null homotopies together leaves you with a map from L to B cube GL1 E. Right? And the next definition is that a brain structure on L is a null homotopy of this map. Right? Um, these brain structures do not always exist. And even if so, there's a space of choices, which is of course parametrized by the homotopy classes of maps from L to B GL1 E. Okay. And of course, this is always relative to a background field. So then the Fukaya category of M with coefficients in E, which of course means with a choice of background field, then has as its objects the, let's say, closed exact Lagrangians together with a brain structure. Right? And the point is that these choices of tangential structures on L are exactly what you need to give coherent orientations on these index bundles. You know, this linearized, where this here, uh, the index of you know, these linearized operator. So this could, where this here could both be the linearized operator of the flow equation, but it could also be the linearized operator of the sort of equations that define the Fukaya A infinity moduli spaces, which are sort of various inhomogeneous cauchy riemann equations, right? And um, for the experts here, this always means with fixed domain curve, right? So this is the index bundle of the equation when considered with a fixed domain curve. So what we're really doing is we're not orienting the moduli space M itself. We are orienting M relative to the moduli of domains. Okay, um, I'm basically out of time, but I have one reasonably short slide left, which I will glaze over, right? 
which is just what this means in practice. When E is the integers, this is exactly the notion of a relative spin structure, right? which has been used in sort of, you know, more traditional definitions than for Kaya category. Um, in the presence of a Lagrangian distribution, so the background field for the sphere, which comes from this Lagrangian distribution, a brain structure on any Lagrangian is, in, is induced by a homotopy between the tangent bundle of the Lagrangian and the distribution restricted to L, right? Um, and this, of course, means a homotopy through Lagrangian distributions. Then finally, when E is complex oriented, there's a canonical background field on M, right? Um, and this comes from sort of a canonical map from BU. So when composing it with BO, you see that there's a universal map from BO to B squared GL1E. Right? And this universal map induces all these maps here for every Lagrangian L, right? So this is some sort of universal series of characteristic classes which characterize for a complex oriented cohomology theory when a Lagrangian defines an object of the Fakaya category. In particular, this means if, the, if your Lagrangian happened to have a, um, trivial tang a trivialized tangent bundle, such as when L was a sphere or a disk or any of the things which go into, you know, what we normally like to talk about with the um, Fukaya, you know, the Fukaya category of a left shift vibration, all of these things carry canonical brain structures, right? Which then allows the computations which I talked about in the first part of this talk to go through, right? Um, yeah, uh, I would maybe also finally remark that if you were to look at the specific case of complex K theory, you can actually check what, how the Atiyah Bot Shapiro spin C orientation deloops. And you see that for a exact graded spin Lagrangian, you get an object of the Fakaya category whenever it also has a string structure. Um, this sounds fancy. What it really means is in the Poznikov tower of O, you have O to S O to spin, right? Well, the next, the next thing which appears in its Poznikov tower is the name by Haynes, Haynes Miller, string, right? Um, so a list of your, if I put Bs here, and I take your Lagrangian L, if you can lift it all the way up here, you can get an object of the Fukaya category with coefficients in K theory. All right, and um, that's all I had to say. Okay, thanks very much, Tim. Uh, let's uh, unmute and clap if we'd like. So we'll enter the uh, Q&A period now if, uh, if uh, there are questions for Tim. And uh, you know, please uh, insert your questions in chat if you'd like, uh, or um, you, know, you can also uh, just unmute yourself at this okay. period. Another question from Danny. Danny, go ahead. OK, so if you have a, a Lagrangian, uh, let's say you have a, uh, yeah, a Lagrangian and a cotangent bundle. Mm -hmm. Then if you have a, a generating family that gives you a null homotopy of the stable Gauss map, mm -hmm. which if I understand correctly is then would, would allow you to, uh, to, to have your, your, um, your K theory, um, floor K theory, whatever that means. And then, and then the natural thing one would expect is that, is that that would be, readable in terms of more theoretic information of that generating function which you use to construct the null homotopy. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you've thought about that. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that is uh, entirely plausible and almost certainly true, but I would give one huge caveat, right, which is that um, when, you know, if you give a, if you have a Lagrangian a cotangent bundle, which has a null homotopy of its Gauss map coming from a generating family, this defines an object of the spectrum for Kaya category with respect to the choice of background field given by the cotangent fibers, right? Um, so the, the sort of Fleur K theory that I used in the first half of this talk, I was always using the canonical orientate, the canonical background field on any symplectic manifold coming from the fact that K theory is a complex orient is a complex orientable theory, right? And this background field in general does not agree with the background field, which comes from the distribution by cotangent fibers. Um, for example, if you were to take T star CP2, um, the zero section does not define an object of the Fukaya category with coefficients in K theory with respect to sort of the canonical complex oriented background class, right? It does not. Um, 
On the other hand, you can still perform, you know, um, on the other hand, you can still sort of get information about the zero section by looking instead at something like the cotangent fiber, which does, you know, which does have this sort of information. Now, in general, I would expect that you could find information by taking whatever you, you know, taking whatever computation you could do with respect to the um, cotangent fiber background field and then twisting all of it, right? And, and this is, you know, sort of what was, you know, uh, what was done by, um, to compute the symplectic homology of T star Q with, you know, with respect to the usual background field for Z. Right, you get a you get the homology of the free loop space twisted by some local system, right? And there's a K-theory analog of this. Okay, thanks. Uh, question, comment, question from Mohammed for the audience. Yeah, sorry. So this is not so much a question for Tim, although maybe he's already thought about it. So the the, the seed of this computation, I mean, the seed of this result, is just this uh, type n, well, type one complex. Um, and uh, it's embedding inside some ball of high dimension. So in principle, you, you know, you, that's why you get this bound. I don't know what you said, 68, 64, some large number. Yeah. Um, but th there, is, there is nothing, at least nothing that I can see that prevents the existence of a Weinstein four manifold that would have um, non-vanishing Fleur K theory but uh, vanishing Fleur homology with integral coefficients. And uh, at some point, I thought there was some progress in the development of this arboreal program, especially in dimension four. So it's, it's very tempting to at least try to see, to kind of push from this constructive direction to see whether it's possible to produce an example uh, in this low dimension. And of course, if you can do it yeah. for K-theory, then the next question I would ask is, can you do it for arbitrary, um, you know, uh, what do they call it? Uh, arbitrary height. So height. basically for Moravian yeah. theory with arbitrary height. So anyway, so this is, as I said, not so much, unless you've already thought about it, not so much a question for Tim, but just a, a general question for the people who actually kind of know how to construct things, which is not me. Which is not me either, so. <laughs> But Mohammed, I don't know what you mean by do this for Morava K theory of arbitrary height. Like Morava K theory isn't even a ring spectrum. Uh, it is an A infinity ring spectrum. Um, and that would definitely be sufficient. To, I mean, that is, su is sufficient to, to talk about symplectic cohomology. Oh, I see, symplectic cohomology. But for instance, like things Tim was saying about like BN of GL1 of such a thing wouldn't exist for N too big. So for, for I would not, uh, I'm not asserting the existence of a Fukaya category with coefficients gotcha. in the ring gotcha. spectrum, uh, but uh, certainly some type of cohomology makes sense. Okay, there's a question for Tim from Marco. Marco, please go ahead. Marco, okay. Yeah, so uh, I brought the question, but uh, I guess, so uh, I'm, if I understood correctly to define this Fukaya category, with E coefficients, you need this mm -hmm. background field for E. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you say that when you have a Lagrangian distribution, uh, they always exist. Maybe mm -hmm. not canonical, but, but they do exist. Uh, and, and so what, one case is when you have a regular Lagrangian vibration, I guess. But uh, do you, so what, what are more cases uh, of that? What if M does not? have an, a clear Lagrangian torus vibration, sorry, Lagrangian regular vibration, for example, can you somehow uh, get this uh, background field from a singular vibration, for example, singular Lagrangian vibration? Yeah, so, um, I mean, there's, uh, you know, there's, I think Danny might be able to say more about what this sort of, uh, you know, the arboreal singularity people have uh, recently been talking about sort of, uh, the Grangian distributions, which on at certain co-dimensions sort of um, are singular and have higher rank components. Um, so, I mean, here we don't actually use, we don't, at no point do we really need to use the fact that you have a regular Lagra Lagrangian vibration per se. All you really need is to know what the image of this Lagrangian vibration is under the J-holomorphism. So I think there's sort of an interesting algebraic topology question, which I'm not really equipped to answer, um, which is, uh, you know, how do these sorts of um, singular Lagrangian vibrations constructed and considered by the arboreal singularity people 
um, behave under the J-Horn or for something, right? Like, you know, can you still, you know, there was this sort of um, fundamental diagram I drew, uh, I've, is, my, is my screen sharing still on or is it frozen? Um, I've, yeah, the, there was this fundamental diagram I, I drew where you took the map from BU to BQGO1S and you looked at the image of BO under this, right? Um, now you could replace BO here with a different classifying space for, you know, these sorts of um, singular Lagrangian vibrations, which Danny talked about. Um, and you might hope that this composite here is null homotopic or close to null homotopic. Um, that's a sort of abstract version of the answer. But I think in practice, for sort of more concrete models of things without um, singularities, you can still say something. Like if you plumb two cotangent bundles together, right? So you have um, uh, two manifolds joined at a point, right? Um, you get a symplectic manifold from this that sort of doesn't have any sort of obvious foliation by Lagrangian manifolds. Right, Lagrangian submanifold, but this actually you can look, you just choose a good local model around the plumbing, and still build a Lagrangian distribution. Of course, this involves some amount of choices, but um, you know, in practice, you can still you, you can still do it in simple examples. So for for any e, let you you can uh, define this Fukaya category of the plumbing of two cotangent bundles. Yes, yeah, because you, okay. you, you, know, you have a Lagrangian distribution in that case. So okay. you okay, get okay. a sphere spectrum and from there for any ring spectrum. Okay, thank you. Other questions for Tim during the official Q&A? Uh, there's a question from Hero. Hero, please go ahead. Ah, here. Um, yeah. Could you, could you, should you say out your question? I don't want to read the, the chat. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, also, Danny had a comment that preceded mine. If you want to. Oh, okay. Let's, what did Danny say? I can read Danny. The necessary condition for an arboreal skeleton seems to be the existence of a Lagrangian distribution which can degenerate to an n minus one isotropic distribution along codimension one. The natural guess is this condition is also sufficient, in which case you should be able to work over the sphere spectrum. But this is just speculation. Okay. I mean, one comment I'd like to say about uh, Danny's thing is, uh, you know, Dan, the phenomenon Danny is talking about is a totally unstable phenomenon, right? It's about a reduction of BUN to BON, right? And I don't know enough about the topology of Danny's situation to speculate about what this would do in, when stabilized, right? Like certain, yeah, okay. Um, and there's the stable situation being important in this work. So Hiro, your question. Yeah, so, um... First of all, it was an awesome talk. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Um, so right, my question is about the, the assertion of the jump from uh, you know, trivializing certain obstructions to asserting a Fukaya category. Mm -hmm. I mean, as you know, like, uh, things like A infinity formulas are incredibly difficult to articulate for spectra. Uh, like you can write them down, but essentially like when you start trying to identify any elements in some homotopy group of maps, uh, you, know, you get into trouble. Uh, so I was wondering mm -hmm. if you could say a little bit more about what you mean by uh, coherence because that's somehow the name of the game. Okay, so do you want to talk about coherent orientations or talk about A infinity formulas? Well, the latter is supposed to be the consequence of the former. Okay, okay. Well, um, okay, so. And we can also leave this for the after Q&A if the answer is too long. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in this also, though, though it, it might be, if there's more to say, it might be better for informal discussion okay. would, be, would be my thinking, uh, okay. in, in case there are other quick questions. I, I have another stupid or way stupid or quick question. Yeah, go for this. Yeah, it has to do with like the equivalence at the very beginning of your talk, uh, where you say that the vanishing of the cohomology of a finite CW complex X uh, mm -hmm. is equivalent to the equivalence of um, V naught and V1 inside of the Fukaya category. Uh, yes. So one direction is clear. If the cohomology vanishes, it's the mapping cone of you know a null map, um, mm -hmm. or the identity. But what what is what's the other direction? Like how do you prove the other direction of that implication? I I, I remember being confused by that. Oh oh um so you the you got two spheres yeah. sitting you 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 it comes from the fact that you've built your symplectic manifold in a particular way by plumbing two spheres uh, together. I see, I see. So, so you, you have these other Lagrangians I haven't talked about, which are the cotangent fibers of those two discs, yeah. right? 
right? And if you like the sort of the, the, the system of, I guess, sort of quotation marks generators of the Fakaya category coming from the, you know, the uh, coming from the two disks is sort of casual dual to the two spheres, right? So you can check whether or not the spheres are isomorphic or so on by looking at the values, where, looking at the flow homology with these disks. You're just saying that you can actually identify which map you're taking the mapping cone of by virtue of the geometry. Yes, exactly. Okay, thank you very much.